Hello. Today we will be talking about the Tetralogy of Fallow. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the pathophysiology, identify the clinical presentation, and understand the management of the Tetralogy of Fallow, which I will call TOF for short. Let's start off with a general overview of congenital heart defects, categorizing them into acyanotic versus cyanotic conditions. Acyanotic conditions have left to right shunting, causing blood to recirculate through the lung. Cyanotic conditions, on the other hand, have right to left shunting. This causes deoxygenated blood in the right side of the heart to bypass the lungs and go straight back into the body without picking up oxygen. An easy way to remember the cyanotic conditions is that they are the five T's. TOF falls under this category and is the most common cause of early cyanosis and the most common congenital heart defect in childhood. The defects seen in TOF are caused by anterior encephalad malalignment of the ventricular septum during development. The portion affected is close to the outflow tracts from the ventricles, causing a variety of problems. This malalignment results in the two important components to the pathophysiology of TOS. There is a large ventricular septal defect, or VSD, plus a situation where right ventricular outflow is obstructed. The VSD in TOF is typically large and unrestricted to flow. This causes the pressures within the right and left ventricles to equalize. Therefore, the direction of flow is determined by the pressure in the outflow tract, meaning that in the aorta versus the pulmonary artery. Normally, the pressure in the aorta is higher and will cause a left-to-right shunt through the VSD. However, in TOF, there is also right ventricular outflow obstruction together with relocation of the aortic root over the VSD itself. The outflow obstruction makes it easier for blood to flow out of the aorta than into the pulmonary system and results in the right-to-left shunt that we see in TOF. The degree of cyanosis observed therefore correlates with the extent of right ventricular flow obstruction, which may vary over time. Increased obstruction leads to increased shunting and therefore increased cyanosis. In the months following birth, pulmonary pressures decrease as the lungs become functional, which may decrease the degree of cyanosis observed. However, the severity of obstruction and changing pressures within the heart may continue to alter causing the child to become increasingly symptomatic over time. In summary, there are four cardinal features of TOF that are important to remember. A VSD, pulmonic stenosis, overriding aorta, and right ventricular hypertrophy due to the increased work of the right ventricle against the outflow obstruction. Although TOF typically occurs sporadically, it may present as part of a congenital syndrome such as Downs or DeGeorge. A slight increase in recurrence among siblings has also been noted. Maternal phenylketonuria has also been identified as a risk factor for TOF. Most patients present in early childhood as the symptoms develop over the first two years of life. However, in this day and age, many TOFs are being picked up in utero, or as newborns noted to be cyanotic at birth or found to have a murmur. Test spells are an important presentation of TOF. These are times of near occlusion of the right ventricular outflow tract, leading to profound hypoxia and cyanosis. The child will be agitated and crying inconsolably. Classically, symptoms resolve with squatting. Now what happens during squatting is that the systemic resistance is increased, promoting left to right shunting and circulation through the lungs. In severe situations, test spells may lead to syncope and even convulsions. On examination, a child will likely be cyanotic and in respiratory distress. A parasternal heave may be present if there is severe right ventricular hypertrophy. You should listen out for a single loud S2 and the presence of a murmur. In TOF, the VSD is usually large and therefore unlikely to cause a murmur. The murmur that you hear in this case will be due to the pulmonic stenosis, which is a harsh crescendo-decrescendo systolic murmur best heard at the left upper sternal border. 
The pathophysiology here is different from pulmonary stenosis due to valvular dysfunction. In this case, as the pulmonic stenosis increases, more blood will shunt through the VSD. Therefore, as the stenosis progresses, the murmur heard will actually become softer. Signs of TOF can be detected on ECG and chest x-ray. Right ventricular hypertrophy can lead to changes on ECG, including right axis deviation. It also shows up as a boot-shaped heart on chest x-ray, as shown here. Chest x-rays may also show decreased pulmonary vascular markings. In terms of diagnosis, as mentioned earlier, TOF can be detected in utero. If it presents in young children or infants, echocardiograms can be used for diagnostic purposes and to evaluate the degree of pulmonic stenosis. Cardiac catheterization can also be done for diagnosis, but is rarely used for this purpose these days. The mainstay therapy for symptomatic TOF is surgical repair. Before surgery, however, prostaglandins can be given to maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus and help maintain pulmonary flow. In the acute management of a TET cell, supplemental oxygen should be provided and the child should be placed in a knee chest position to simulate squatting with compression on the iliac arteries to increase systemic resistance. If more aggressive treatment is needed, a fluid bolus can be given to increase right ventricular filling together with morphine that acts to both sedate the child and relax the pulmonary infundibulum. Beta blockers decrease right ventricular contractility and heart rate and possibly relax the right ventricular outflow tract, thus promoting pulmonary blood flow. If these are still insufficient, phenylephrine can help increase systemic resistance. Early surgical intervention has been shown to minimize secondary damage to the heart and other organs. However, the optimal timing for this is still debatable. Intervention can either be complete surgical repair or the placement of a blalock tausig shunt, which is usually used for palliative measures. Antibiotic prophylaxis against bacterial endocarditis is indicated for children with congenital heart defects. It is needed if TOF is unrepaired, if palliative shunts are in place, or if there are residual defects at or near prosthetic patches. For patients undergoing complete surgical repair, antibiotic coverage should be given for the six months following the procedure. In summary, TOF is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect and consists of a VSD, pulmonic stenosis, overriding aorta, and right ventricular hypertrophy. It can be diagnosed either in utero or with a 2D echocardiogram, and signs of TOF can be picked up through the physical exam, ECG, and chest x-ray. Patient management involves prostaglandins for ductal patency, acute management of TET cells, and the appropriate bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis. The mainstay of treatment for TOF, however, is surgical intervention.